Good morning and welcome to this webinar from the businessdesk.com in partnership with Cornerstone Tax Advisory. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to look at one of the biggest issues facing property owners today, the overpayment of tax on previous transactions. This session is going to split into two parts. The first will be a short introduction from David Hanna, Principal Consultant at Cornerstone Tax Advisors, uh, and then we will move into a panel discussion. So I'm just going to let David come online and I will hand over to him now. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks very much, Ben. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, as Ben has said, we're just going to go through a short explanation of the issues and then we'll get again to discussion uh, about how they impact both developers. And we're, we're very pleased to have Hockley Developments with us today and also talk to the professional risks and technical uh, consultant for SDLT Compass uh, online software for solicitors to go through the conveyances perspective. But let's start with the introduction. Hopefully you will now see this and you are, that's good. So what's the big issue and why are there so many overpayments? A little bit about us because it's not exclusively about us. We're a firm of chartered tax advisors. We were formed in 2006. We specialise in property tax matters, specifically SDLT. Uh, and we provide a comprehensive service from full certification of SDLT payable, relief claims, and indeed advice on structuring transactions to optimise tax reliefs and minimise tax exposure. We can do this both pre-transaction and post-transaction with what we call a health check, which usually, of course, leads to a refund and any advice we give you is covered by professional indemnity insurance. So a quick reprise about stamp duty land tax, introduced in 2003, replaced the old stamp duty. Unhelpfully, it went from being a duty on documents to being a self-assessment tax, that is, it's on the purchaser. It's not, nothing to do with the registration of title anymore. They can't block registration because you haven't paid SDLT or you haven't paid the right amount. And it's been changed pretty much every year since 2003 with more and more additions, alterations, surcharges, etc. Importantly, it applies to all acquisitions of residential and non-residential land and property interests in the UK. So conversely, you, you will always get a chargeable uh, transaction when you transfer title. But sometimes you can have a chargeable transaction when title doesn't move. And similarly, occasional movements of title, for example, on transfers out of trust or revocations of trust, have no tax, even though you are registering title. As we said, it's complex. You have a multitude of factors, the type of property you're buying, the type of purchaser you are, the type of transaction it is, whether it's linked, whether you're connected parties. With residential, of course, you have to factor in the number of dwellings that you already own and the type of consideration you provide. And indeed, from 1st of April this year, you also have to be able to show that you were in the UK for 183 days out of the previous 365 uh, up to the date of completion. Otherwise, you also pay a 2% non-resident surcharge. So complicated? Yes. You can indeed end up with multiple rates for the same property, and we'll go on a bit more uh, about that in a minute. But specifically, you could end up with a commercial rate or a mixed-use rate. You could end up with a lower rate if you claim multiple dwellings relief. And if you're unfortunate enough to buy a, a residential property over half a million in a limited company and allow a relative to live in it, you could indeed end up with a flat rate of 15%. The problem we've experienced structurally, and, I'm, and I know Hannah and I are both very sympathetic to this, is that the solicitors and conveyances do not have the time or indeed the experience or expertise to fully understand the intricacies of SDLT. Uh, and the up to 49 exemptions and release which might apply on your transaction. So what have been the issues? Well, well of course, I've just said we have the 2% non-resident surcharge. Your residential rate could now be 12, 15 or 17%. But if you're not residential or not wholly residential, then it's 5%. 
interestingly this surcharge and particularly the non-resident surcharge was introduced to deal with the problem of foreign buyers uh, but it's little appreciated that it can apply to UK citizens who for whatever reason haven't been in this country over the last 12 months um, think people who have been locked down in New Zealand and Australia haven't been able to return home if they buy a property within six months of returning they're going to have to pay a two percent surcharge luckily if it's their new home they'll be able to recover it but otherwise not similarly UK companies which would in instinctively would not be regarded as foreign may be non-resident if all or a majority of the shareholders are overseas we've had this consistent problem with multiple dwellings relief over the years and indeed hmrc in their guidance at one stage said that you had to pay a minimum three percent rate on a multiple dwellings transaction even if the multiple dwellings transaction was mixed i.e flats with a shop on the ground floor in November 2020, after a battle that lasted nearly two years, they actually climbed down on this and amended their guidance, but they did it in a, in a way that, shall we say, hid their embarrassment. As a result of all this complexity and errors, we're starting to see a growing awareness of problems. And one of the big problems that we've identified in the last two years is that under certain circumstances, which are actually a lot more widespread than people want to uh, realize, is that transfers or sales of property into your SIP, your SAS pension scheme, or a trust of any description have been made to pay SDLT since 2007, when in fact they shouldn't have done. And this has been estimated to be as much as £10 billion in overpaid tax, which is a compensation storm waiting to happen. Stamp duty refunds. During lockdown, we saw a nearly 300% increase in reclaims, primarily because people had the time and set, sat at home to be able to think back and go, hold on a minute, maybe I need to get that checked. And uh, indeed, Cornerstone have recovered over 15 million pounds in the last 12 months uh, from SDLT overpayments. What also has occurred is a sea change in the conveyancing industry. There's been an increase in the awareness of these problems, so much so that conveyancing quality scheme solicitors now have to double check their SDLT calculation. And uh, I think the quote here, which came from the uh, Law Society, there is a very real risk that the SDLT could inherit the scandal throne from PPI. Um, as unscrupulous companies encourage dissatisfied clients to put in a claim. I'm not sure it's entirely scrupulous, unscrupulous to encourage people to get their tax correct um, and to seek recompense where they have been made to suffer a loss. Um, that might be a slightly um, over defensive characterization. We've, of course, had the issue and it, 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 it's still a, a, a thorny issue. 17% maximum rate versus 5% maximum rate. If you buy a property that is uninhabitable, uh, then you don't pay the residential rate, you pay the non-residential rate. Um, and although there's only been one case on it so far, PM Bewley Limited, which was interesting because it not only generated a win for the taxpayer, but they'd also overpaid anyway. So the court not only handed them a victory, but also handed them a refund. And uh, HMRC's arguments were in the words of the judges. Well, the quote was, at times we wondered what exactly what HMRC's argument was. Indeed, at one point, we wondered whether they in fact had one. Probably the most damning words you'll ever see in a tribunal judgment. And again, back to 2018, emphasizing just how long this, this issue has been going on. We estimate, and uh, I, I think we're probably about right, is that over two billion a year is overpaid unknowingly by property purchasers. When HMRC were asked to comment on this in 2018, they came out with the famous line that their online calculator is meant to be a guide, not a final figure. And I don't know how many of you use HMRC's calculator, sorry, estimator. Uh, but it's interesting because it says click here to tell you how much to pay 
not click here to tell you how much to guesstimate PS you're supposed to do it properly. Um, if that was a commercial organization, you'd probably get them for misleading advertising, but moving on. So what can developers, investors, and even private clients do? Look at the tax reliefs. I mean, you know, multiple dwellings relief is, is, is the big one that a lot of people are aware of. But in fact, there are 49 reliefs. Some of them give a 100% exemption from SDLT. If you're into your pension scheme transactions, standard commercial practice, owner managed business partnerships, LLPs or limited companies selling or transferring business premises into pensions have unwittingly paid SDLT when they shouldn't. And indeed, I've already delivered one briefing at the House of Laws to the pension industry and Omicron permitting, I'll be delivering another briefing next week on this subject because it is of serious concern that so many pension funds and thereby pensioners may have lost out on anything from 20 to as much as £90,000 of pension capital, which looking towards retirement, as I know some of us are, is not an insignificant sum when a pension scheme is capped at a million in the main these days. Property traders, again, people who buy, sell property, you see adverts for these people. There are five specific reliefs which give 100% exemption to property traders. Now, the, what can you do about it? Well, get some advice, get some advice pre-completion. Indeed, on projects where SDLT is a significant deal cost and affecting the profitability, get the advice before you even commit to the deal so that you know going in what your exposures are going to be. If you've already completed a deal, certainly in the last 12 months, but in some cases up to the last four years, you can we can do a post-completion review to see that your conveyancer has actually calculated the SDLT accurately. And in terms of overall tax efficiencies, think about using tax efficient structures. A lot of people use SPVs, limited companies, in other words, but not many uh, other than sophisticated investors actually use corporate groups. And while this isn't necessarily an SDLT point, you get into terrible problems trying to move capital around to fund deals when you've got different companies that are not members of the same group. Looking at the common issues, uninhabitable. Um, that's one that we did. Um, the property uh, was purchased in 2018 only for 180,000. We identified it was uninhabitable because it had no functioning services and indeed actually had some structural damage that made it unsafe to live in. Uh, but the client had already paid residential plus surcharge and we actually got him back £5,900 plus interest. Uh, permitted development. This is a multiple dwellings issue. Again, you know, if you buy a site with permitted development right for conversion or indeed partial demolition and reconstruction, uh, then you can claim multiple dwellings relief at the moment you acquire the site, even though you haven't started the conversion necessarily, provided you commence works on the day of completion, or indeed the vendor has commenced some works, then you will get multiple dwellings relief. The net effect on a £4.7 million deal was a repayment of 106000 Planning permission is an interesting point. Again, by a site, three and a half million. The land had the benefit of planning permission for demolition and construction, along with a communal garden. Because the development of proposal had been approved, it again meant that the land uh, was eligible for multiple dwellings relief. Uh, and not only that, it would have been mixed use so that the client could have enjoyed the minimum rate of MDR at 1%, not the minimum surcharge rate of 3%. And again, we got the client £68,000 back. And these are not isolated incidents. These are the sort of things we see day in, day out. And the final issue, incorporation, been very popular in the private rental sector for the last few years because of the loss of in higher rate income tax relief. And if you own property jointly, you don't need to have a formally registered partnership for SDLT purposes, I would stress. Uh, then you do not pay SDLT on the transfer from that partnership to a connected person, in this case, a limited company, 
but note that that connected person could be a trust or a pension or indeed a relative. Uh, and quite often we're seeing situations where tax has been paid when it shouldn't have been. And in this particular case, we were able to get £18,500 back. So how do we do what we do? It's fairly simple. We do a free, no obligation review of any deal pre or post completion. You can contact us at these lovely detailed information. You can also find us on social media. Um, we have a particularly uh, boring YouTube channel. I say that because I'm the only person who ever appears and I never watch myself back. Uh, but uh, thank you for listening. And at this point, I'm going to stop the share, go back to the main screen and we can start the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, David. That was uh, that was insightful and, and certainly interesting to hear, you know, how prevalent the uh, the problem is. So we now move on to the second part of the session. And I'd like to welcome back the, the sort of our other two panelists. So Alan Forsyth and Hannah McAlinley. McAlinley. I can't, I can't get my teeth in this morning. McKinley. Hannah, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, to start, David, Hannah, I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourselves and tell me why you believe the challenges, uh, the challenges exist around SDLT that David sort of mentioned there. And I'm going to start with Hannah because she's the person underneath me on my screen. So to Hannah first. Thank you, Ben. Well, my name is Hannah McKinley and I am a commercial property solicitor who's worked for large and medium sized firms dealing with commercial property and property development in particular for a very long time. And the issue is that since 2003, solicitors are still treating it like the old stamp duty it was before. I've had the fortune or misfortune to be lecturing on SDLP since, it date, since the very day it came in on the 1st of December. And I'm astonished that when I'm doing lectures, often to big firms, city firms, etc., I find when I ask them if they've had any training on SDLT, they in, in, invariably say no. And I say, well, well, how do you know what to pay? And they'll say, well, it's straightforward, isn't it? It's just stamp duty. And really the penny has not dropped in 17 years of me ranting at solicitors that it is in fact not stamp duty and that it is in fact a transaction tax and that it's much more than just looking at a transfer. You have to look at the surroundings of the transaction. You have to look at other transactions and in particular, you have to look at the individual whether it's a company or, or a person who is doing the buying. And not only that, if they're an individual, who they are married to and what that person owns and what other property interests that they have. Plus, you have to look at the physical information about the property and its history too. But all of this falls upon deaf ears. The result is that I, I remember doing many, many talks on SDLT. And I was amazed how many times I would get finance directors of large PLCs coming along and you know they're the sort of people that usually get carried around by servants rather than actually turn up and do anything themselves and they would admit that the reason they were coming along is because they're often very good and very respected London city firms had no idea what they were doing and they wanted to hear from me what it was that they should be doing because when challenging their city firms they, and, and other firms, they'd be saying, oh, don't worry about it. We've never had a query, not realizing that it's a self-assessed tax. And it's up to you to work out what the tax is. And the HMRC don't check it, nor do they send it back to you if there's been an overpayment. One um, finance director of a major London PLC said that 75% of the tax returns that their very well-respected city firm did were wrong. That's 75%. And these are often high value leasing transactions, high value purchases. And their attitude was to just brush it off and say, oh, it's just stamp duty. Don't worry about it. And they would say, well, look, this is actually your my money that you're spending. And you don't seem to be concerned about whether you're paying the right amount or not. I've had just about every retailer finance director or financial controller on the high street coming along to my courses, complaining that their solicitors don't know how to do commercial leases. One particular retailer, which has got hundreds of shops, said that they've written to their well-respected firm of solicitors and said, either you go through all the tax returns that you've done and correct them, 
or alternatively, we're going to report you to the SRA and instruct someone to sue you for negligence. And we don't expect to pay for any of this work because you should have done it already. I've had most of the large, I can't mention, I shouldn't, well, I can't really mention names of well-known retailers that you all shop at from the high to the low who have the same problem. I had one estates director of a um, very large conglomerate brewer, bowling clubs, alleys, etc., who said that their finance director had told him that as far as he was aware, there were probably 500 to 1,000 different high value properties where the wrong amount of tax had been paid. And he couldn't get any sense from his solicitors who just fobbed him off and would say, oh, it's just stamp duty, don't worry about it. Now, the numbers involved are often six figures, sometimes seven figures. Now, to deal with clients' money with such a level of carelessness is frankly something that I would like to see the SRA, and the Law Society is useless anyway, but the SRA should be thinking about this. And really the reason for this is that the Law Society has served us up on a plate in 2003 and not really said to solicitors, look, this is a serious tax that you need to deal with appropriately and you need to get proper advice. And having spoken to people at the SRA, who are gay, it is quite clear that they do not understand it and they just see it as a routine matter. So it is an epidemic and it is something which um, people just either turn a blind eye to or, or, or fob off. But anyway, that's my rant. Or no. I, didn't warn you that. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. I, I, it's my own fault. I forgot the word succinct at the start of that question. But no, it was, it's fascinating. And you really do demonstrate how wide ranging it is and actually the, the real cost. So I guess, again, same question to you, uh, Alan. Uh, introduce yourself and you know can you share your opinion on why you think this is this is such challenging perhaps if you've if, you, if you've had any experience yourselves with Hockley Developments. Yeah thanks Ben uh, yeah I'm Alan Forsyth from Hockley Developments uh, residential developer in Nottingham and uh, as Hannah uh, so well put there yes it certainly can be challenging and, and certainly for us as developers that are not specialists in it it's something that, as you say you, you take the, the legal uh, your conveyancer's advice on. Now, I, I think I only just started to become more aware of this in the last uh, couple of months. And when you look at, we probably transact maybe by five, say five sites a year, uh, majority already with planning in. Um, and if those sites say in total cost three million pounds and, and actually you've overpaid by 2% uh, on wow. the SDLT, then you know that's potentially 60,000 overpaid per annum and you know if you've been buying that number of sites for five years that that's that's a lot of a lot of added money uh, that you've been you've been paying across so uh, we've started to analyze it much more closely and and uh, as David said looking back over four years at um, transactions we've done and certainly it's a good you know it's an eye-opener really when you see uh, you know we have enough challenges in development with the rising construction costs and lots of other costs and uh, uh, S106s and so on. So, it, you know, obviously that's that could be a huge thing, which obviously puts money back in um, to the company and, and can be put into other areas. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd certainly recommend, as David's put there, other developers that are listening in to, you know, speak to David's company there uh, and you know, check back your paperwork and look at, you know, completion statements. And uh, uh, as I say, David would have a sort of checklist of what to go through there. But yeah, you know, it's certainly, as I'm you a... said, every conveyancer I know just uses the same calculator uh, online. And, and that is it, you know, that, that, that is exactly how they'll do it. Um, and I've only ever challenged once on there, uh, but the rest of the time, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely not specialists and, and I, I don't think any of them have had added training uh, no i mean what's that. what's really fascinating is um uh, alan and thank you for sharing your perspective is, is that it's not just you know what i would describe and please excuse me small developers that this is affecting i mean we did a review three months ago um for a client and, and he'd overpaid by 7.2 million on three deals oh. his law firm is one i can't name naturally um but 
when he went to them and he said, look, guys, I think I've overpaid by 7.2 million. Their response literally was, well, we're not technical experts. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think an error of 7.2 million probably deserves a cup of coffee and an apology, not just a shrug of the shoulders. But I mean, as you know, I share Hannah's experience uh, of lecturing. And when we, I mean, I used to do a straw poll when I lectured and you get 50 members of law firms, not necessarily solicitors, because generally they used to send along their admin staff because they regarded it as an administration function. And you would stand in the room and say, how many, how many people think there are five or fewer reliefs of SDLT? And, you know, about a third of the hands go up. How many think there are 10 or fewer? And two thirds of the hands would go up. How many think there are 15 or fewer? Nearly every hand went up. And when you stood there and went, Chat, no, no, ladies and gentlemen, there are 49. There'd be this gasp of disbelief. Now, if you think about it statistically, if there are 50 reliefs and they only at most know about 15, that means probably two thirds of all relief eligible transactions are being missed. Um, you know, the probate relief, and I know you're not a trader, but we ha I, had a, I had an absolutely classic conversation uh, with a solicitor in the east of England. I'm not even going to name the county. We're talking about probate relief. And, you know, when you buy from a uh, decedent's estate, if you're planning to sell the property on subject to certain limits, you get 100% exemption. And this, this, this solicitor went, David, that's fascinating. When was that introduced? I said 2003. And the colour drained from his face because he—you can imagine—he's sitting there going, "Hang on, I've got 17 years, and I've been—I've been doing those for 17 years and having them pay tax." You know, but, it, but this this inter this makes it's an interesting point because you're right. 17 years is a long time. It, you know, it's a long time for something to have been around and still to be misunderstood. So, you know, from what you know, David and Hannah, you've both said, it feels like there's there's a, a missing link in the education of this, like that 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 you know, lawyers who we all expect to, to be up on up to date on on well on the legal requirements of things are missing a trick so how how could we go about fixing this you know in an ideal world if if government turned around to you you Hannah and David and went look we've realized there's a bit of an issue with this solve it for us well I don't know how much you charge them but uh, give me how you do it I, I mean the first, first thing that happened is that rather than it being given to the VAT people who are ruthless and everyone fears them, and in which case solicitors would have been quaking in their boots within about six months. Because I mean, if you ever had to deal with the SFA, you know, the Stasi, I think they all left and joined the VAT Customs and Excise section. Um, they gave it to the rather dopey people, I have to say that, in the Birmingham Stamp Office, who were used to just sticking the red stamps on things. And really, they just didn't have the understanding. Plus, there was really no enforcement. So if you've got if you had a speeding cameras and nobody bothered actually using them, nobody would take any notice, would they? You know, and so because of lack of enforcement and because of this idea that it was just stamp duty and, and the solicitors didn't really explain to clients that it wasn't just stamp duty, it just went completely under the radar. And that's why. But if and they'd given it to the VAT office, it would have been a different story altogether. Yeah, there's also a structural issue insofar as I've heard an HMRC officer in court say that they only look for underpayments. They don't they don't check for overpayments. I mean, turkeys don't vote for Christmas, do they? <laughs> now, you hand somebody half a million pounds of your money and say, look, if I've given you too much, mate, give it me back. No, it never happens. No. Um, so there's a, there is a structural problem there. There's, a, there's, there's an issue inside it's, HMRC. It's a self-assessed tax. It's, it's a self-assessed self tax. tax. They're going to go... Like your income tax. If you're a plumber and you send £20,000 too much income tax, nobody says, oh, do you realise you could claim for your van? Do you realise you could claim for that? No, it's they don't tax. do that. No, no. Although, as, Al, as Alan will tell you, given what plumbers are now charging on a day rate because of the labour shortage, the, the odds of them paying to any thousand too much is probably nil. Um, mm. I mean, but I mean, I give, give, just go back to you, Alan, if I might, because I think it, it's, it's also you, you made allusion to this, that we've got supply chain issues. We've got labour supply issues. We've got rising costs in development. Thankfully, at the moment, we've got rising property prices as well. <laughs> But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a significant, you know, a significant impactor on profitability of any given project, isn't it? If you, if you pay too much bloody stamp duty on the way in, it's not like VAT, you can't recover it like input tax. 
Well, I mean, is that fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's a, you know, say I was, it's just when I was calculating the numbers there and uh, it's always added cost. So your, and your lender won't cover that in terms of that, you know, if I say the lender will cover 100% of development costs. So it's always added money you're finding, as you say, on day one um, that is going out. And uh, yeah, across four or five sites and across four or five years, the figures really do add up. Um, so it, it's certainly one that, you know, we'll make sure we analyze everything in advance going forward. And obviously we're, we're back going through it, but obviously as, as David has sort of highlighted there, well, I think you can go back four years, but obviously it's a pretty, pretty slow process once it's more than 12 months back, I believe. So, um, you know, can, I don't think well, it, there's can, a huge, yeah. it can be. Um, I mean, HMRC naturally are doing what I describe, especially in the current climate, doing what I call debit management. Oh, don't worry, the check's in the post. Hang on a minute. I'm sure I saw your... You get various reasons. They're supposed to process They're supposed to process a refund and then check later in the same way as they, they do with SDLT returns, but they're not. Right. Um, and we've had stuff that's been, I think, outstanding for nearly eight months. Mm. When Every time you ring them, they go, oh, it's with technical strangely nobody can find technical's phone number um, no. i don't know what i you know i'm i don't know maybe it is with technical uh but yeah it, it, it it's an interesting problem i mean one of the things that i think we ought to highlight in this is that if you want to get it back from hmrc yes you're right it's up to four years if you want to get it back and it's outside that period then you've only got one route and that's to go after your solicitor um and i'm you know i'm not a great fan of being sued therefore i'm not a great fan of advocating suing people but you know as hannah i think as hannah's emphasized you know ultimately these people put that number on the return for you and said trust me i'm a lawyer um should they not be held accountable in your view it, it's a it's a fair point and and, and, a, and, a, and an interesting one and um, just a, a quick heads up to anyone watching that if they want to ask any questions of our panel they can do using the q in uh, the q a function at the bottom of the screen uh equally we have had some sent in in advance uh so before my first one has to be uh can sit no, they've, they've they've know there's reliefs available but someone's asked can they claim similar reliefs in scotland and wales david i guess that's one yeah, I mean, broadly, when they devolve the taxes into LBTT in Scotland and LTT in Wales, so many acronyms, um, they copied over most of the major reliefs. There were some minor tweaks, uh, particularly in Wales, but broadly, yes. And, and, and actually, that, that raises a point because you referenced that people treat it like stamp duty. Do you think part of the problem is the fact that they put stamp duty land tax in, they put stamp duty in the name? Oh, it was probably the worst deliberate. piece of misleading branding I've ever seen. <laughs> well, it, was um, it was deliberate because the government didn't want to put another tax on property that mm -hmm. they intended to then increase quite dramatically and, and put the wedge in to differentiate. So to call it stamp duty land tax was just mis-selling, really. <laughs> they called it land transaction tax. Um, Tory MPs in the shires would be revolting in Parliament. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Hannah, as you might recall, when they first proposed the, the Scottish tax, they actually referred to that as Scottish land transaction tax. And then they changed it after people used the acronym SLUT. <laughs> um, and that's genuinely why they changed it. Um, because they didn't like the idea. Uh, and, and I guess that then, you know, the other part that caught me when you were talking, David, was obviously it came in in 2003, but you've said it's been updated almost annually since oh, yeah. surely that that in itself then poses further problems for understanding it because if it's constantly evolving you, you might get your head around it by december to then only find it changes again in, in march or, or whatever and, and that well th i mean this is planet tax if you have to take into account court decisions revenue guidance it actually changes almost every month <laughs> um you know one week you'll be told right this is how you do this according to the guidance then they publish updated guidance and they go oh, hang on where's that bit gone oh we decided to delete that or uh, i mean there's, there's been a couple of famous instances where the revenue actually abolished a form 
and never thought about whether it was needed. They just took their own view that, oh, we don't need that form anymore. And that was, of course, was the SDLT 60 cell certificate where you could write, I don't need to do a return and get your registration. They abolished that only to find that there were a hard, large coterie of transactions that don't need an SDLT return. For example, transfers into and out of partnerships don't always need an SDLT return, but they do need land registration. And suddenly, they went, oh, well, just register by letter. Well, poor old land registry weren't even briefed on this. They started getting these letters and they started referring them all to the revenue. So it was, it was an even bigger buggers model than just having this self certificate. So I've got, another, I've got a few more questions from the audience. So uh, quickly, a uh, quick one. What is the definition of un, unhabitable for a, for a property to receive the lower rate of SDLT? It's a fairly easy one. I mean, there's a couple of legal definitions, which ironically aren't in SDLT, um, which is section seven of the Housing Act 1957. It must have cooking, cleaning, toilet, bathing uh, facilities. Uh, ex exceptionally, there's also now the Human Habitation Act 2018, which broadened the definition of what is not an, or what an inhabitable property needs to be for the purposes of private rental. So now the presence of damp, mold, uh, poor ventilation can actually prevent a property from being inhabited. Um, a simple baseline um, is would you, as an individual, move into that today and say, I'm home? If, if the answer is no, then it's not inhabitable. I mean, one of the problems in Bewley, and particularly Bewley, and just for the, by way of background, that was a bungalow that was advertised as being suitable for refurbishment in fact it was a made of asbestos it was clearly something you would not want to live in and the Bewley's actually demolished it but when the revenue presented their argument one of the arguments they presented on the, the, the property was inhabitable was that on occasions a tramp might choose to spend the night there <laughs> now you understand why the judges made the comments they did <laughs> The other comment was that the property was mortgageable. Um, and look, here's a copy of the mortgage on the property. And the representative of the revenue held up a contract for the purchase of it. And where it says 4% on over base. And then the other side pointed out, no, my dear, sorry, that's a contract. That's not a mortgage. You know, that's why you get the sort of comments that you did from the judge. And, and, and then uh, another one that uh, Elizabeth uh, Casey's asked is, you know, what's the what's your view on the MDR consultation document that was issued yesterday? Uh, they, well, I, think, I think that one's been aimed at you, and I think I might know that it could be a long answer. So let, let's keep it. Let's well, keep it, short. it it's going to be a short answer. I haven't read it in detail yet. Um, I've already been contacted by by specialists, tax advisors, accountants, and indeed others, other other professionals, to ask me what my views will be. Um, I haven't formed them. We have to remember that multiple dwellings relief was introduced for two reasons. One was to correct an obvious injustice that if without multiple dwellings relief, if I choose to buy five properties, I pay tax on the whole bundle, which of course would push me into the higher rates. So that was one of the reasons it was introduced. The second one was to actually assist the house building sector um, when and the private rental sector at the time, you know, builders wanted to buy sites that they could um, make cost effective, which is what, what's been going on. I recognise that the, the government attitude to the private rental sector has changed in the last 11 years. But fundamentally, the reasons behind it and that correction of that fundamental injustice haven't gone away. The moot point is whether the 3% surcharge which doesn't apply if you buy a mixed use multiple dwellings ought to apply. And in other words, the revenue tried to steer things back to say, well, actually our guidance was correct. Again, I don't believe that that's right or appropriate because there are certain instances where you might buy a substantial mixed use property with multiple dwellings on it. Why should you pay surcharge? The kind of example I'm thinking of is farms, where there's workers' cottages, equestrian estates, where there's workers. But what about any other property where you provide worker-related accommodation? Are you going to now pay surcharge on that? And surely it wasn't in the surcharge was intended to punish second home buyers, and indeed 
deter the private rental sector from hoovering up the available stock, making it available to first-time buyers. I don't see that for turning the clock back four years or 11 years is going to fundamentally improve the market. And I think one of the things I saw in the commentary was that certain taxpayers are getting an unfair advantage. Let's be clear, it's not a taxpayer advantage. The relief is available based on the inherent characteristics of the property that you're buying. Why would it be considered unfair if you purchased something that somebody else wasn't interested in and you've got a better tax rate? I, 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 we, we have different tax rates anyway. And, and I guess, uh, Alan, one for you. Um... You've, you've talked about the fact that you've been going through this and looking at the numbers yourself and seeing the potential impact it can have, you know, for the business. Uh, I guess how how hard is that process? You know, d you know, going back and looking at how hard is it to claim that money back? How you know how how has that experience been from you from a, from someone looking at doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think we'd certainly use a specialist to to assist with us uh, with it. I mean, obviously, you're, you're looking back at starting point is your, your sort of completion statements and 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 just the, the characteristics as David says of the of the property you know did it and obviously that's quite a crucial one did it have planning permission before you acquired the property um, characteristics of it in terms of what you bought previously and then checking obviously how the for the the SDLT forms will filled in by your lawyer um, I believe any photos you've got from that completion period as well are, are, are useful to have and, and so on. So, no, I mean, it's one that there's a clear incentive to spend a bit of time on it when you can see some of the numbers involved. So, you know, even if it takes a day to get the paperwork ready per site, then that, that's a pretty good use of a day. So uh, it's, it's not a bad day, pay, pay rate for the day, is it? Let's be honest. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. And I think, um, and then obviously once you get your, your systems in place, whether it's, you know, yourself or one of your team, then you, you, you know, you know what to be doing for, for every site coming up and going forward. So, um, no, I, I, I'd say as long as you're, you know, your paperwork is in pretty good order in advance, then it, it, it shouldn't be too bad there. And, and as I say, it's important to, uh, yeah, work with with a specialist. In my opinion, on that as well. And, and then a couple more questions from the audience as well. So, uh, one from Gordon: uh, Would the purchase of a single freehold building that is divided into six flats, not under leasehold arrangements, qualify for multiple dwellings relief? Short answer: Yes. There we go. Nice and quick. I like I like I like it when they're like that. There you go, Gordon. Uh, another one from Elizabeth. Uh, in in what circumstances can you reclaim within the four year period? Well, as a general rule, you've only got twelve months to amend your return. The, 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 beyond twelve months, up to four years, you're applying for something called repayment relief, which, if anybody's a a, a law nerd, is Para Thirty Four Schedule Ten for Mansat Two Thousand and Three. That has certain exclusions, and one of them is you have to be able to demonstrate that you could not be, at the time you did the return, be reasonably aware um, of, of the mistake. Now, that's where the revenue, you know, revenue is sort of trying to knock them out of court, going, well, you ought to have been aware. You know, you, you as the taxpayer ought to know everything there is to know about SDLT, um, which, believe me, nobody does. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, generally, I mean, the, the kind of easy kill stuff on four year rules are the connected party transactions where tax has been paid and shouldn't. The revenue do not have a problem with those. Multiple dwellings relief will depend on the context of each transaction. Um, similarly, you have to distinguish between claims that could have been made in the return and inside 12 months, they're easy. Outside 12 months, less so. I'm not, I'm noticing I'm not saying impossible, I'm just saying. Whereas putting in a return that you shouldn't have done, that's slightly easier to demonstrate at law. So that's broadly it. And, and you know, we, we are approaching sort of toward the end of the session. So actually, I'm going to say, you know, we, we can clearly see that SDLT is a big challenge uh, for the sector and could have a big impact. But uh, Alan, David, you both hinted that there are other other challenges on the horizon and you know uh, i'm going to go a little bit crystal ball -y and say you know as we move to, we're looking into 2022 it is it is on the horizon now you know what other challenges do you see for the for the sector particularly because it's been so buoyant over the last the, the property market's been so buoyant over the last 18 19 months uh, you know what do you see moving forward being those those risks and those things that you are maybe keeping you a little bit 
or keeping you up a little bit at night would be the way to put it. Uh, and I'm going to go round the panel. So we'll start with Alan first, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I think uh, construction costs is, is, is been the biggest change this year to see uh, some of the changes that um, from staggering increases month to month on one or two products. Uh, thankfully, overall, some of the, some areas have settled down, and if you can, you know, get your orders in in advance, and uh, often paying larger deposits up front to secure prices is, is being done. But yeah, I, I would say construction costs. I, I think, as you put, the the, the market itself has been pretty buoyant um, through the last eighteen months. Probably surprised some of us, which has has been really positive, um, and and that supply and demand isn't changing really. It's certainly in our markets and things, which is positive, but. I think the, the some of the unknowns and some of the construction costs would probably be the the, the one area that uh, we're, we're keeping close to. Uh, Hannah, I guess yeah, same question to you. What do you foresee being a challenge for the? As a, as a, I think it's a good result that solicitors who are always uh, under immense pressure to keep their costs down and um, don't really ever seem to be able to stand up to clients and say this needs advice, this costs money, etc. Nobody gives advice for free because of the problems with the negligence claims and now finding the strength to say to clients in the same way as they might do about planning advice or structural advice or building contracts or litigation. Look, this is not within our specialism. We're exceptionally good at commercial property, but we are not tax lawyers. Therefore, you we cannot be expected to deal with this and you will need to get specialist advice and accept that you have to pay for it right at the beginning of the transaction rather than putting the cart before the horse and guessing it and then being um, slated at the end when they realize that it's not so complicated. So solicitors finally being able to say, we need to refer it and we need to charge you more money. And clients have to accept that they have to pay people for specialist advice. Well, and if it can save you some money at the end of the day, surely that's that's money well spent. And David, uh, same question to you. What what is it that you're seeing challenge wise and, and opportunities in the sector? Well, I'll follow. I mean, I'll follow on from Hannah's remarks first of all. With with, with you know, and, and she's quite right about what she's saying. I think there's an anus horribilis coming for the, for law firms. They're they're seeing seventy five percent increase in PI premiums, rising claims, uh, and people have got to get used to the idea that you know. Uh, conveyancing advice and the associated tax advice needs to be paid for. I mean, you know, the, the famous quote, I believe, was from Red Adair, which says, you know, if you think it's expensive to hire a professional, wait till you hire an amateur. <laughs> as, like as, far, as far as the as far as the property sector is concerned, yeah. and, and, you know, and I, I appreciate Alan's comments, because actually that's mirroring what I'm hearing around the UK. What we are seeing, we had that 56% collapse in transactions in October following the end of the holiday. Estate agents' windows are full, but unfortunately, there are sole properties that estate agents are saying that they're not getting new instructions. Now, normally that wouldn't happen until today, 1st of December. It actually started to happen on the 1st of November. We've run the very real risk that there's going to be a lack of, I'll call it supply in terms of new listings and with developers not able to complete developments that there's going to be an excess of demand over supply that is going to drive price inflation i think through q1 q2 next year possibly beyond and i don't believe that the bank of england has got a lot of scope for raising interest rates materially in an attempt to curb in curb consumer inflation which may well be actually be just an artificial uh, problem because of supply chain issues not just in the construction industry but in, in all aspects of the global economy as we know you can't get a chip to put in a car so you can't get a new car at the moment as a result second-hand car prices are rising so probably going to take six may six months maybe 12 months for the global supply chain to sort itself out but we will wait to see and and on that well slight bombshell uh that you know who, who would have thought we'd get from SDLT to uh, chips going into cars uh, when we started this morning at 10 o'clock? But uh, that, that's where we got to. So thank you very much to all the panellists. Thank you very much to everyone who's joined us. There will be a full write-up of this session uh, available on thebusinessdesk.com along with a video made available through our YouTube channel. If you do have any further questions, I'm certain that David and the team at Cornerstone uh, will be happy to uh, provide you their expertise. Uh, and 
the documents that he shared will be made available after this presentation as well. So thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. Thanks very much indeed, Ben. Thanks a lot. Bye.